My name is uh, Steve Sims. I'm a DVS here at Stanford. I work at a company called Badgeville where I'm the chief design officer. For what it's worth, I do behavioral modification, nudge systems, things like that. Um, but really what we're here to talk about is kind of our esteemed guests here. We have a really, really interesting uh, group of people here to talk about how do you augment intelligence at scale? How do you, you build into that cl collection to help both in social environments and learning environments and stuff? So um, with that, I'd like to kind of introduce our first, our first speaker, uh, Gene. And if I, if I pronounce anybody's name wrong, please forgive me. I, Gene, Gene is great. Uh, <laughs> I was going to go for the whole thing, Gene Beliveau Dunn. Was that close? My wife humiliates me all the time about my inability to pronounce things. So um, anyway, um, Gene is the Chief Knowledge Officer at Cisco. She's the VP and GM of Cisco Services and President and Chairman of the Internet of Things in the Talent Consortium. She's a 20-year career uh, veteran with Cisco and is named one of the 2015 top most powerful women in tech by the National Diversity Council. Jean is an expert of, uh, on the workplace of the future and has brought uh, first social education systems in the industry to market in 2008, uh, otherwise known as the Cisco Learning Network. And she also serves on a number of advisory boards for organizations uh, committed to continuous learning and talent. So with that, um, our first speaker, uh, Jean Bellevue Dunn. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, augmented intelligence from the standpoint of not just what we see coming in the future and the things that we're investing in and how we look at this, but um, also give you a sense of some of the things that are actually going on in real world. Because I know there's lots of great studies out there, and it's um, actually pretty easy to get your hands on research. But what's not always easy to get your hands on are real live examples of these things um, happening in everyday life. So um, one of the things that I wanted to start with and lead with is you know, th this idea of automation has had many different evolutions. And of course, it, it started with this aspect of you know, making sure that those dirty, dangerous jobs out there, and you know, being the president of the IoT consortium, I can tell you there are many, many dirty, dangerous jobs, whether they're in energy, whether they're in law, law enforcement, whether they're in the military, or even just in things like sanitation. There are many, many dirty, dangerous jobs out there that you don't want human beings doing. They can get hurt, um, and they can sacrifice their lives trying to do something very, very simple that can be done by a machine. And so that's kind of where things started. And in fact, the military, the government, was really the first users of those things. If you can imagine all the military applications for robotics, all the military applications for um, using um, uh, different types of uh, augmented machinery that's you know driven, controlled, driven by, by somewhere else to drive into danger zones, all of that came uh, originally from, uh, from the government. And of course, what, what happened after that is many of the large industries that could make use of it, like you think about um, oil rigs, you know, if you're trying to, to drill for oil or if you're, you're out there in the, you know, on a, an oil rig uh, as a human being, you know, this can be a pretty dangerous place to be if there's a middle of a storm in the middle of the sea. And so what people have been doing now, companies have been doing, is they've been doing some things to make sure that we can um, monitor those rigs, sense things in the ground, right, use technology to do all of this, and then to be able to report it back into some central office where somebody can do something about it and make automated decisions about it. Right? So that was sort of the first step of it. That's where IoT really began and you know, started this evolution. The second phase of this really came from this idea of, uh, you know, there are really mundane tasks that, that uh, everyone has to you know, um, have within companies out there that you may not want to have human beings doing all the time, you know, whether it's you know, automated call centers and things, things that we all, by the way, most of us hate, right? How many of you like automated call centers? How many of you hung up on automated call centers? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. And in fact, there's been, a, the interesting dynamic for me is that, um, you know, Cisco's never gone automated in the front end, we've always gone automated on the back end. And that's where I think the real magic of machine intelligence really works is when you use technology to create faster processing of data, more precise actions, and you let human beings make ultimate decisions, whether through policies or through just being there and directing it, right? whether it's through, through central management of it. And so that's, that's where we see what I think is you know, the real killer applications, if you will, 
for augmented intelligence. And when we think about um, also the world of data, today we live in a world of data that is very, very unstructured. In fact, over 80% of data and information out there is unstructured. And data lives out on the edge. It lives in retail stores. It, it lives on mobile apps. It lives on websites owned by many different companies, right? And so you, you, we get lots and lots of data out there at the edge. And a lot of that data is not just you know, web streams of, you know, of text. It's actually video. And in fact, video is becoming the major form of data out there. And if you think about what that does to how you're going to try to make decisions on it, how you're going to try to run through lots and lots and lots of video text to try to determine some information out of that, and to be able to do that through a human eye, that's difficult. And that's extremely time consuming. Right? So finding ways to use, you know, taking a look at all this unstructured data and finding ways to actually um, search through it, come up with information from it, and to make decisions on it, that's also the big game today in augmented intelligence. And so we use that on the back end to um, essentially come up with applications and um, different scenarios where we can make decisions as, as leaders. So if I'm running, let's say, a retail business, and I'm trying to um, you know, drive automated decisions to push a promotion to somebody who's in my store, be, having all kinds of interesting data and being able to literally program the system to make the decision point and push it in a moment of need when, without having human beings involved, that's what we're really talking about is automating this next wave of decision making. So, when we think about technology in this way, we think about technology as a way to augment human beings. Not to replace human beings, but to augment human beings. Now, it doesn't mean that jobs don't change. It doesn't mean that jobs, some jobs don't go away and new jobs are created. In fact, it means exactly that, right? Um, in fact, a lot of the work that I do is I go out there and do research on the future of jobs, where jobs have been, where jobs are going, what it, how this is all this you know, technology is going to impact work and life. And then what do we want to do about it? And I'll tell you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt out there in the world about this topic. But companies like Cisco and, and many others who are at the leading edge of technology are really thinking through the human dynamics of this. Because we know that at the end of the day, human beings don't want to talk to robots for the most part. They want to talk to other human beings. But they want those human beings to be the smartest they possibly can. And having systems behind them that actually allow that to happen, that allow them to you know, essentially capture information quickly, analyze it, make decisions on it quickly, that's where the magic is. And so it's all about trying to drive new kinds of outcomes, whether that be healthcare outcomes for people to enhance people's lives, um, be able to help people, give them new services they couldn't have in the past, or simply you know, to be able to run your business every day. And so the, the idea of augmented intelligence to us really comes in many different forms, but we are trying to use technology, data information um, as a way to help us make better decision making in the world of massive data that is completely on overload. There's no way that human beings can actually analyze this the old way anymore. There's no back room anymore that has all this data. Data is living everywhere. And you need machines to be able to calculate and sift through it and find the nuggets that are important that human beings need to look at. And so that is really um, what we think the future of this is. And if you think about this from the standpoint of a human being and healthcare and what is um, you know, happening over the course of a lifetime of, of any one of us in the room here, um, there's a tremendous amount of things that happen to you during your life that get captured. Right? And, and if you could think about it, if all of that could be captured in a central database where any doctor that was serving you, no matter where you were in the world, could actually access that. And not just access that data, but literally plug in a formula and get an answer very quickly so that you didn't even have to come into the office. Right? So that you could call up your doctor and say, hey, I'm having these symptoms. This is what's going on. They can literally plug in a formula and get some really good answers back. That's, that's the future of medicine. You know, it's not just t today we're using it to, um, to help uh, with surgical procedures. So, you know, almost 50% of surgery now is being done through robotics. But, of course, the robots aren't doing the surgery. They're aiding the surgeon in the surgery. There's a surgeon behind driving the machine that's actually doing this. 
Um, and so we're going to see more and more of these kinds of things that help human beings be more precise, you know, more accurate, be able to do it in faster times, get to answers more quickly, and that's, that's where we see the magic. Um, machines, you know, of course, are not built to actually make decisions. They are there to follow through on decisions you program it to do. So everything has to be hard-coded into machines. You have to teach machines to do the things they need to do. And so um, one of the things that we're doing right now, we're in the process of actually using Watson to um, uh, do some very specific things in our support centers because we have very, very complex networks installed around the world. And we have customers calling up with these really, you know, interesting challenges and problems and they have unique environments that we want to be able to plug into that environment, find out what's going on and instantly come up with some, some responses to that. So, so helping again a human being be able to come up with that answer fast, having an answer to a customer in you know, a minute versus five days is really important, particularly if the network isn't working right. So these are the kind of applications that we think are very, very helpful um, to the future of mankind and certainly to the future of work. And so this is really going to create a set of new uh, capabilities in the world. We are going to have to think about what human beings are going to need to do in the, in the future of work. We're going to have to think about the role of the human being, the, the role of data, the role of the machine, and how do we partner um, and, and drive the things to do what we want them to do versus being driven by it. And so that is really, you know, both the um, professional um, decision, but also the dilemma in society overall is, you know, we don't want machines taking over the world. That's not, you know, all the science fiction stuff. That's clearly people are, you know, still concerned about that. And that's, that's always an outcome if you let things get out of hand. But if you make good decisions and you use machines for the right purposes to actually help humans, um, then you know you can in fact make great progress, and we also see that this is something that is going to require a huge investment in continuous learning for people um, through their lifetimes. In the past, you were able to have one career, one job, uh, and and you know essentially do that for your life. And now we're finding people have three and four different careers, never mind jobs. Um, they transform themselves many, many times, and they're going to need to in this new world of the future because everything's moving so fast. You know, the, the bar continues to be lifted for what human intelligence means and what it means to be best in craft at what you do every day. And so we we think that you know um, there's a there's obviously a number of things we need to do. We need to ourselves be able to uh, inspire and innovate the future workforce. We need to be able to um, direct the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to the right places and the right solutions uh, and make sure that, you know, we are, as leaders do a good job of, you know, not just directing that but stating the ground rules of how we want to use it. And of course, there's going to be a huge, for those of us that are in industry or going into industry, many of us will have teams that will be, their job will be to train the robots, to train the machines what to do, to feed it with information because the reality is is that the machines can't do anything that they haven't been fed to do or programmed to do. So that is going to be our work ahead is to figure out how to do that efficiently and how to make sure that we can make use of it. Using Watson, for example, you know, we have to do an enormous amount of programming into the machine and data information into the machine before it has any use whatsoever to us. Likewise, in a medical application, it has to have an amazing amount of data before it can actually start functioning properly. So this is where we really are, you know, in this land of augmented intelligence versus, you know, all the science fiction stuff. But we do believe there's great promise and hope for, um, you know, business to, to do better, for life to do better, and certainly for human beings to be a lot smarter through this um, technology. And, and for us at Cisco, we've, we've done a number of things internally to use uh, intelligence in, in, in many different ways. Um, the first step we did 10 years ago was to try to figure out how do you uh, take a person's capabilities, what used to be called an expert that was maybe took 10 years to achieve, and make that happen in one year. How do you do that? How do you change the way that you teach and learn and develop people so that you can actually make them expert within a year? 
And that was the first program we did, and that was extremely successful. We learned a lot through that whole process of how to design learning systems that learn about you and teach you the way you need to be taught and fill in the gaps. So that, that was our first, first piece of work. The second thing that we did is we created this thing called social learning. And social learning was this idea that Cisco will never have all the answers to every problem or every question that our customers ask. So how do we find a way to use the collective intelligence of the community to drive better answers, whether it's in supporting our technologies and products or whether we wanted um, you know, answers to s some simple questions. The community actually had answers and being able to leverage that using digital systems became a foundation for our learning 10 years ago. Then we started to virtualize learning environments, creating, creating virtual environments that allowed people to learn no matter where they were, to take the physical place and time issues out of learning, to give people access to information and capabilities and to, to work within the um, learning system on a personalized level and get feedback in a way that made sense. So um, our ability to virtualize that, put that in the cloud, right, and drive this kind of, um, if you will, augmented learning uh, has, has proven to be quite, quite effective for us and we are, we are scaling up millions of people uh, in this uh, model today. Then we developed something called collaborative knowledge and collaborative knowledge is a technology that, um, in fact, Kathy is sitting in the front of the room here, you'll probably meet sometime during the conference, so she is the developer of this, but collaborative knowledge is a technology that we we put together that um, allows us to bring forward this idea of social learning, virtualized learning environments, mobility, and then putting analytics and data analysis over the top and automation to drive automated learning. And so this is something that um, you know we've just started um, working with this past year and we're already seeing some, some really great results. And so we, what we want to move is we want to move essentially our sort of everyday work into a point in our in everyday teaching actually from, from being events to being a just-in-time system that is always available to people. We believe learning is, is, you know, is, is fundamentally changing in every possible way you can think of and that being able to really transform learning into more decision-based tools, information systems, knowledge systems that can provide um, contextual information back to you of what you need in the moment of need, that's really where um, learning is going because there's just no way to house all of the things that you need to do in your jobs of the future right here. There's just no way. So technology is going to be a big part of our lives going forward. It's going to continue to fuel our expertise. It's going to continue to be um, a, a great asset in making us better, stronger, more capable. Uh, and of course, it requires us to use it in responsible ways. Uh, thank you very much. Let me introduce our next uh, speaker. Um, Kerry Hearn Smith is the Vice President of Learning and Strategy of Global Solutions for Xerox Learning. Uh, Kerry is responsible for leading Xerox Learning's thought leadership, learning strategy and design team and global solutions architecture team. Whoop, there we go. Supporting, supporting uh, <laughs> team, uh, supporting growth sales for Xerox's learning outsourcing capability group. She's also an active figure in the L&D space for thought leadership and new trends impacting culture and human performance management in organizations. Prior to Xerox, Ms. Hearn Smith was the organizational psychologist and senior performance strategist at AxiPoint, uh, if I got that wrong, I apologize, an organizational development and assessment company specializing in design and implementation of high performance organizational learning environments. She's over 20 years experience with Fortune 100 companies around the globe, um, we're gonna save some time here, on engagements requiring organizational cultural renewal, strategic alignment, organizational assessments, change leadership and management, uh, curriculum program design, executive and leadership development, coaching and talent capitalization. Um, Carrie is a member of Future Workplace Advisory Board and active in a number of orf effective organizations. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. So she's awesome. So anyway, <laughs> with that, <laughs> with that, here you go, Carrie. That's long when somebody reads it. <laughs> you think you write it and you're like, oh, yeah, we'll just put it in. So I, I'm going to pick up on a lot of things from what Jean mentioned and we'll definitely go into some of where you were pointing that question as well. Um, 
I'm here to talk from a very practical application side of all of this, where we have gone on a journey over the last couple of years in creating um, Xerox Services University. So we took our population and looked at it as, you know, this is something that Xerox has always been known for being ahead of the game in the world of technology. And as a, as a, a services side of the organization, we're changing the look of that a little bit because there are really two distinct sides of Xerox. There's the, the legacy technology side that you all know what very, very well, which is the document, printing, copiers, everything. Um, but then there's the services side, which people don't necessarily know that well. However, it's been out there for many years. So that's the business process outsourcing side. So we have a number of different capabilities within that business process outsourcing. So when you're zipping through Chicago on the highway and that easy pass is, is great to have because you don't have to stop. We're doing, we're processing all those transactions. That's our trans transaction capability. We have healthcare capability. We have public sector capability. We have learning and legal capability. I fall in the learning and legal capability. So client Xerox is actually my main client. So of 100,000 people, 105,000 roughly people that we have in our organization, um, that's where we really started our strategy trend around learning and saying, okay, we really need to be in a thought leading space here. So we started doing a lot of research a few years ago just specifically in that space. And over the two and a half years or so since we started this quest for the university and using it with our own people, we, we very much adopted a fail fast concept that we knew we wanted to be ahead of that curve. And like you said, it's constantly changing. We knew technology was going to play a huge part in this, but how do you keep up with that when it's changing so much? So you'll see that we really started at the concept creation side um, back in January 2014. We really had it narrowed into being a leadership institute. It was going to be fairly exclusive, and we were really focusing on, on micro learning, which was about 20 minutes at that time. So very different story today. Um, and, and we were thinking we had some very innovative technologies to use. And, and so we started it with a social platform. And that platform had a very strong algorithm underneath it that was all competency based. So we thought this is good because we're very much a competency driven organization. And people know when they're in their role what kind of competencies they should be effective at. So this environment allowed them to go in and choose and rate themselves on specific competencies. And then they could start matching. So it kind of did the match.com process along with the amazon.com process of saying, oh, but wouldn't you like to look at this one or wouldn't you like to look at this one? And so it started matching people up to advise or be advised in different roles and different competencies in a social environment. So, Again, back to that fail fast kind of concept. Um, by the time we actually launched it in September of 2014, we had revamped the whole thought process, process of it being exclusive. We wanted it out for everybody. Everybody's a leader in their own right. So let's get this out to everybody and see what we, we, the response we get. So we went charging head on into that. We started with the platform. And the immediate feedback from the platform was the fact of, great, OK, it's nice to go in and try to find some of these groups that I might have like interest with so we can have some communities practice or interest going on in there. But there's nothing intuitive about it. And it it's kind of has stuff all over the place, so I'm overwhelmed when I go out there. So I don't probably want to go back because I really only have five minutes in my day to go do this. So that was a fail fast concept where we said, OK, this isn't necessarily getting us to where we need to be. And it, it, it really pushed it to that point of it, they shouldn't need to be trained on the technology or in the environment necessarily. It, sh it needs to be intuitive. And so we missed on that goal. So we, we fast forward into September 2015. We looked at all the things that people needed to feel that they had application to and access to in order to find quick information. So that became our concept of what do people do when they have a question? They Google it. So why not create that kind of environment for them to be able to do that easily within their day? 
So now what we have is an ecosystem, and that forward, fast forwards us into what we're working on today, is really the concept around the entire ecosystem, knowing that every single employee is an individual contributor to the, the wealth and the breadth and depth of this ecosystem. So that's starting to change and get into the concept of, it's an, we want a completely different employee experience here. We want people knowing that they can be a part of growing the whole, expanding the whole, bettering the whole, and bettering themselves in the process. So we really started connecting to what makes people curious. And when they're curious, what do they do? They tend to want to learn more. And when they're learning more because it's driven by curiosity, they tend to want to learn, go even further on it, and they tend to apply more readily. So all of this was wrapped into our research of how the workforce is changing. And we certainly know that we need to be ahead of this because within four years, upwards to 75% of the, of the population in the workforce is going to be made up of millennials and Gen Zs. They're not gonna put up with the old LMS compliance training, 20 minute, 40 minute e-learning e page turners that are out there. That's not gonna do it for them. So we built this system, this ecosystem that really, at this point in time, and again, it's still all evolving. So we started with the social platform, which is your, your middle plank there. But then we went to the on-demand. This is your Google Learning in Xerox. This is where when you have a question, you go out there, you have a free moment, you have a topic that you just heard about, you wanna go find out more about it, you go to this area. This environment is very intuitive. It's very easy. Again, it's not something that someone should have to be taught to use. You go in, you see the search bar, you see my learning, today's learning, how to connect with others. All of this is in that environment, but it really is focused on that just in time, in the moment when you need it, in the moment to learn. And so now I'm becoming self-directed in my own learning. And that's what we're expressing through that employee experience and making sure that we build it into the whole process. It, it tracks easily, they get a dashboard, they, in, a, in a click of a, 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 just a click, they can either see what they're lear they've learned today, this week, this month, this year, and they get a colorful dashboard that says, oh wow, you've, you've spent 30% of your time just learning in this topic alone, or 20% of your time, or 5%, or 1% here. That also now starts to pull in, as a manager, I can sit down and see what my employees are doing. Where are they spending their time? And if I see things come up like, wow, you know, I have one of my employees that's been out there putting all his time in gamification, looking at gamification, learning more about gamification, um, I'm, I'm gonna sit down and talk to him about it. We may not have had him on any projects that he was even using gamification with, and now I need to tap into that expertise. So those kind of things that are happening in that environment now give the employee their ownership of their own learning. And so what each one of the pathways in this environment is created out of is total curation. So we've moved away from the content development, which is time consuming and resource intense and technology intense to this world of the internet of things where the content's out there. How do you bring it in? So now we have some algorithms within this platform that help us to curate the right kind of content and make sense of all the overwhelm of information out there. So a lot of the, the it sounds like the work you're doing <laughs> with, the, with the knowledge capture. So some of those aspects, that's all that's, that's flooding in with all the curation pieces that we're working on. And just for an example, at the, in January, and maybe if many of you have heard, our organization announced a splitting into two separate entities. So as January 1, 2017, we will be two completely separate entities, the Xerox technology side, the BPO services side. So obviously within the, the total 140,000 people, that created a lot of underlying current of concern, unknownness, which creates fear. So we had all those issues going on. So we thought, gosh, you know, one of the things that we really need in this environment right now is something that's going to address those concerns. So we started a pathway on times of change. And then another series out of that came up with 
creating the culture you want, branding yourself, all of those kind of things flooded through that. And within a couple weeks, we had all these pathways out there curated so people could go out and get the kind of information they needed at the time that they needed it. They can go through it in whatever sequence they want. Um, they can go out and curate more on their own. So now we're starting getting to get into the user-generated curation as well. So that helps that system continue to grow. How we link the two, or three, is that every one of the pathways we create, times of change, um, whether it's around a specific role, supervisory learning or training frontline level learning, um, any of those pieces, or if it's a competency driven, customer care, relationship building, whatever the pathway be, may be about, we drive them into the social environment through an engagement. So that's part of the activity that comes out if you're working through a pathway and learning a particular topic or competency. Now you can go create and, and inter interject with people in the social environment to complete those activities. And that's where our many-to-many -many learning starts to, to take hold. So then we have our third platform, which is a hybrid LMS. And although when, when I started this whole process, I said, we're getting rid of the LMS. It's a goodbye thing. Nobody wants to do it anymore. Nobody wants to be driven to the LMS. Um, we're still not quite there. And there really isn't the technology out there yet that's going to really handle all that repository side of it and the compliance side of it. So we worked internally and grew our own LMS. So it's a very hybrid, but acts very similar with a little bit more structure and control than our on-demand environment. So this is really where the portal comes in. People come in to learn in this, and this is where they, their single source of learning record resides. So we have all three of these environments working together. Everything drives to the center, to the social side, to be able to take that tacit knowledge and move it into some of the institutional knowledge that we can capture in that social environment. So again, all behind this is, it, is the technology. And it's augmenting some of those pieces that we want to make sure people have everything at their ac easy access and that it is intuitive. And so going through the process, what we've really learned is where people need to be trained about this is the fact that not only did we introduce a lot of technology, but yes, we hope it's easy technology. But we also introduced a whole new approach to learning. We weren't traditionally a learning culture. We still are not. I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. But we're getting closer. And it's that ability to say, wow, I can learn in the moment. And the fact that I go look at something in, a, in pathways, and, I've re and I, all I did was put it into the search bar, and I read an article on it, that's the informal learning that we're saying is just as important or more important to your role, to how you succeed as anything else. And that is the uniqueness about our Pathways environment is it tracks all formal and informal learning. And that's where we've really tipped the scale. So we have so much data about the learners now and what they're going after, which helps us send the message across the organization how critical learning is to our competitive advantage. So that's where we've really gone with the university, and we've really worked hard to, to teach people this process, that people spend time learning in all different ways. So we're spending a lot of time now just getting the mindset to shift, the mindset to go from stop thinking about learning as an event. It's not something that should break the flow of your work. It should be something that blurs between your work and you're learning, it's all interjected together, it's happening on an ongoing moment basis throughout your day, every day. It's those pieces that when people get away from this side saying, oh, when I go to a live, live class, that's learning. Or when I sit down, I've read the whole book, that's learning. That's not the case. Learning happens in all different ways all the time. So that's really the mindset shift, and that's more what we find is the need to train people on or to get them thinking differently. So as we go through, again, as I mentioned, that's where we're really trying to make the difference, is the fact that it's about the employee experience. We're moving from that one-to-one -to, -one to many to many concept. It's really about building our own competitive edge. 
And of course, this is, again, we're a business process outsourcing, so companies come to us to outsource all of their learning. We are doing this and building this internally, but now we are taking it to the market. So we, this is a marketable product for us as well. So as we go through, again, it's about the learning culture. And what we really have figured out is one of the secret sauce pieces of our entire process is we shifted our entire learning capability, all of our designers, all of the people working behind the scenes and building this, to the concept of a, of a pathway mindset. And it's that pathway mindset, learning in a pathway, that links lots of different micro learning aspects or curated assets together in a contextual way. It's more than just going out and saying, oh, this is an article about this topic. I'll, I'll go find as many as I can and just throw them in, a, in, in one folder and let people have it. It's linked contextually. It's got the activities built behind it. It's got a call to action throughout the process. It has involvement from many different directions and that call into that social environment. That's where we're finding it's making a difference. And again, we're, we're, we're definitely in still an evolution phase on this. We see a lot more play in the technology as we go forward. We, we are working towards how do we really get this personalized to every single learner so that when that learner turns on their computer in the morning or, or fires up their smartphone or their iPad, it says, wow, you left off here. And because you were doing this, I, this is where you should go next. And so it's personalizing and it's driving that learning on a continual basis. That's where we're really looking for the next set of technology to take us and really help augment me as a learner and always making sure I'm at my highest point in my learning curve. So this is where we're really working towards. Again, the pathway learning is, is not about completion and it's about consumption and that's another piece of that mindset that I think is a big shift for a lot of people out there, a lot of organizations out there. We need to stop saying, oh, I checked the box, so I'm done, I learned, because that doesn't tell us anything. We need to move more towards that consumption mode. What are, what are people consuming? What are they interested in? What's driving the curiosity? So as I mentioned, we have tons and tons of data that's behind the scenes in all of this technology. And so now, that's the next piece, too, we're looking at, is how do we make sense out of that, all that data? We're, we're, we've got a, a number of different experiments going on in the process right now that we're, we're vetting it. But one of the biggest things we're seeing is we're measuring certain roles and what kind of learning those people are, are going for in those roles. And it's amazing how many people, once they get into this environment and they get used to it, they start adopting it, how many different areas of learning they, they branch out into. And we're correlating how many of those people are moving outside of their role, either outside of the organization or within the organization, due to having the ability to be able to go out there and have an environment they can learn anything and everything. So we're finding those that have that voracious appetite for learning on whatever it may be, tend to be more motivated to be doing anything different in the organization as well, and maybe finding a better fit for themselves than they ever would have had they not had that environment. So thank you. Uh, let me do my quick introduction. I apologize in advance. I'm going to do my best to pronounce names correctly. Dr. Candace Till is an assistant uh, professor of education at Stanford's Graduate School of Education and a senior research fellow uh, for the Office of the Vice Provost for Online Learning. Uh, Candace is also the founding director of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. Her research focuses on applying results from the learning sciences to the design, implementation, and evaluation of open web-based learning environments. So very applicable to all this. Dr. Till served on a U.S. Department of Education working group co-authoring the National Education Technology Plan, which is being enacted now. Please welcome Dr. Till. Thank you. Okay. Hi, so I don't have PowerPoints. Um, and, and I know you've been listening here for a moment, so I want to get some information. I always believe in understanding a little bit about my students' prior knowledge before I jump in and stri start trying to tell you things. So I want to, so get ready, because I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm going to want some responses. So I talk to a lot of groups about technology and higher education. And there's lots of buzz out there about how technology is going to 
disrupt, transform, in some way majorly shift higher education. Um, so I'm sure, how many of you have been thinking about that at all? Anybody? Okay, great. So when I ask groups, okay, what's gonna do it? What about technology is going to disrupt or transform higher education? I usually get one of three answers. So rather than circling the room and saying, what do you think, what do you think, I'm gonna give you the three answers and then you can tell me which one resonates for you. Okay? So listen, because I'm gonna only tell you them once. The first one, access, convenience. It's what the big promise of MOOCs was. If you have a computer, you can learn anytime, any place. Access and convenience. The second one, and most of my work up until the last few years, was in thinking about what can we do with the technology to support learning that would be really hard to do in a person-based classroom. The computer can do all kinds of cool stuff. Simulations. So I can be teaching an engineering course. We can have the students build bridges, actually build them. They collapse. Nobody dies. We can have them look at microscopic levels, nano levels of processes happening that we can't show them in the real world. We can personalize the learning to them. So this capacity of simulation that we can't do in the classroom, that's the big power that's gonna blow us away. Number two. Number three, nah, Candace, it's not about what an individual learner can do with a computer. It's not about access. It's not about simulation. It's that these computers are connected to a big network and provide connectivity. So learners can now be connected to all kinds of resources, to other experts, to other learners. The power is the connection. Okay, so those are the three. Give you a moment to reflect. Now, by show of hands, how many of you, bet on one, how many of you putting your bet on access and convenience? That's really the power that's gonna transform, the big power. Okay, raise your hands high, okay. Now, how many people say, no, it's not the access and convenience, it is really about the simulation, about the things you can do with a computer that you just can't do in a place-based classroom. Okay, great. Okay, how many of you are saying that, yeah, you guys are old school. That's so 20th century. It is connection. That's the power, connection. Okay, that's interesting. And I'll tell you, as I've asked that question over time, the distribution has changed a bit. How many of you are thinking, okay, Candace, we heard you were in the Graduate School of Education. Why are you giving us a crummy multiple choice test? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so how many of you wished I had had all of the above? What is that? Okay. How many of you wished I had had none of the above? Okay. For none of the above, what would you put? If, what 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 didn't I list that you would put? Well, I think it's external factors that are changing, and this isn't about just uh, connecting things. So, unless you bring in what is relevant to the external factors, I, I kind of felt that it was all very much like. Okay, so you just didn't like my question. Uh, my question was, what is the affordance of the technology that will yeah, transform yes, education? I, I think okay, the one. I think the third one. that's great. Um, that's great. So actually, I agree with all of you in the sense that I think they are all critically important. And I also think that the thing that I think is the most important about the technology was not what I listed. It's been mentioned here. You've been talking about it all day. It's what Google has figured out. It's what Netflix has figured out. 
It's what Xerox and Cisco have figured out. The power of this technology is not using it to distribute, to push stuff out. The power of this technology is to push it to the interface. Why? Yeah, but what do you need to personalize? At the interface, what can we do? We can observe the user. Now, Netflix, Google, probably Cisco and Xerox, they're observing us in their interfaces all the time. Why? Why observe the user in the interface? to learn about them, usually in some cases, so we can market to you better, um, so we can figure out what product you actually need and give it to you. So you might think that's kind of, a lot of people, especially when I'm talking to other faculty, think it's kind of creepy that I am suggesting that we push things to the interface, observe learners to use this technique to be able to know them better as consumers. And I agree, that would be creepy. But I'm not trying to know them better as consumers. I'm trying to know them better as learners. Both individual learners, so that if I can understand your learning trajectory and where you are on that trajectory, I can support decision making to help support your learning better, but also to learn about learners in general better, which is what gets me very excited because we design these learning environments so that the students are interacting with the technology in the interface. No more ask a question, have a student download it, do something over here, upload it, because all of that doing something over here is what we need to be able to see, what we need to be able to observe. So we need to design those interfaces so they're interacting and learning in the interface where we can observe essentially every external move that is material to making an inference about how they're learning. And with that data, we can build really interesting predictive and explanatory models and use the information that we generate from those models to drive very powerful feedback loops to all of the actors in the educational ecosystem. So one of those actors is obviously the learner. So if I can observe your learning and get a, make a prediction about where you are with respect to some desired outcome, then I can give you feedback that will help you monitor and guide your own learning better. If, uh, if I'm collecting the individual interactions from a whole class, in a more traditional educational setting, then I can give that modeled data to an instructor in a good visualization to support that instructor to take an action to better support the learners. So I, I teach, uh, one of the courses I teach here at Stanford is data analysis and interpretation. And I have a, an a open web-based environment that I designed when I was back, still at Carnegie Mellon, and I have my learners work through that, instead of giving them a textbook and saying, gee, uh, read chapter seven, do some problem sets or whatever, I say to them, I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I say to them on Thursday night, work through module three and finish before 10 o'clock Monday night, because I teach at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. And so I want time, so they're working through the interactive activities, they're getting support, they're getting feedback, um, and the system is collecting data and it's running that data through a cognitive model. And from that model, making a prediction for me about where my students are along various learning trajectories. So I can look at that Tuesday morning and then decide, oh, this is what I'm gonna do in class today instead of what maybe I normally would have done. The third feedback loop is to the course developers. Now that course that I was talking about, I didn't build by myself. Brought together teams. Teams of statistics faculty, human computer interaction experts, some said human computer interaction experts, software engineers, learning uh, scientists, all coming together to bring that diversity of expertise to think about how do we design an environment that actually supports learning. 
And I'll tell you that, so that, that environment that I'm talking about doesn't just get used by me, it gets used by faculty all over the country. So the individual learner gets feedback based on their data. I, as a faculty member, get feedback based on my students in my class. The course design team gets feedback from all of the classes all over the country that are using that piece of courseware. Then the fourth feedback loop, which is actually the one that's the nearest to my heart, is the feedback to the learning researchers. Every single intervention, every single activity that we build into that environment is an experiment. We have a hypothesis. If, if we want learners to be able to understand the central limit theorem and be able to do this with it, then given what we know about how conceptual change happens, et cetera, et cetera, we design this activity because we believe that that will support that learner or those group of learners to move from where they are to where we want them to go. But we recognize that it's a hypothesis. And so once the learners are engaging in it, we collect the data and we can refine both the activity itself but also our underlying understanding of how learning happens. And, that's a, and that changes the way we can do learning research um, at scale with very tight feedback loops. In, in the spirit of the person who wasn't here, they'll play the video, which was a five minute video. It's interesting, it's about Telecom Italia. Hello to everyone and greetings to our moderator. Uh, to my fellow speakers, uh, to uh, all of the participants, and to the organizers of this wonderful event. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be part of it, uh, even if the circumstances have not allowed me to be there physically with you. But thank you to the support of all of the MediaX team, in particular uh, Martha and uh, Karina and Jason, I have been able to um, address my message and tape it and um, deliver it to you today. Now, uh, today we, we will be speaking of augmented intelligence and we all know that this means um, the way that uh, we have the possibility of enhancing our mental processes, our intelligence and our way of adapting to the surrounding environment, which is constantly changing um, in the past uh, years and which really requires us to adapt and to adjust to all of the changes that, um, that we are facing. And all of this is possible uh, through new interfaces and new technology. Companies, as we know, uh, have been disrupted uh, from the digital transformation and all of the employees are now being asked to address their work in a different way and to be more efficient and to do their jobs quicker at a faster pace and to be more focused and to measure their results in a very, very uh, strict way. And this means a very big cultural change and a big change in the skills um, that the employees uh, must, uh, must acquire. In TIM, we have been facing uh, the business disruption and transformation uh, by um, activating different streams of work inside the HR department. Uh, we have been redesigning and rethinking all of the processes and the tools that we have been uh, using traditionally in order to um, help employees keep the pace with the evolution and all of the change which is required uh, from them. In particular, um, I have been working on a project which is the Tim Academy, the um, company's corporate university, and the model and the concept which guided uh, the entire project is the life cycle of the competencies where we basically look at the renewal of the business system and at the new knowledge that we need to transition the company from one stage to the next. And then we move into um, the phase in of the strategic competencies, which we start bringing in by training people or by hiring the people that have these new competencies 
to a phase in which you spread these competencies throughout the company uh, at a large scale. And then finally, in the end, there will um, be a moment in which these competencies will become obsolete and we, need, we'll, we will need actually to uh, substitute them. If we look at the model of Tim Academy, it uh, replicates the, um, the competency cycle. And on the left-hand side, we see um, the part of the model which uh, speaks with the external stakeholders. And we have two models here, the observatory on new capabilities in which we engage uh, employees which are experts on certain topics and research centers and visionary people which help us track and see what the trends are um, from a skills standpoint. And then we uh, started establishing strategic partnerships with universities and vendors and other uh, peer companies in order to acquire and co-create knowledge with them. And on the right hand side of the figure you can see what we are doing for our employees, uh, investing in their training, uh, basically on culture and transformation, on new business skills, on core business skills, and on factory activity skills. And all of this has been done through a new digital platform and new classrooms, which have an entire new concept on how to manage training in presence and we all know about the flipped classroom and all of the new technology that we can use um, in, in, the physical, uh, in the physical classrooms. Um, we have also designed a new knowledge management system which is based on communities in which uh, people interact uh, in an interfunctional way, exchanging knowledge and exchanging best practices. And in the end, uh, we have also worked on building a new faculty of social digital um, educators which are able to deliver uh, training through new technology. And of course, uh, we also implemented the new digital platform which also has a social network inside which allows people to uh, exchange their ideas among themselves and among um, and, and, and together with, uh, with the educators. Um, and you can see this in the demo area where there is a video which um, shows you how the platform actually works and is articulated. Uh, thank you all for your attention and please feel free to contact me. My contact details um, have been showed on the last chart and I will be willing to um, exchange ideas and knowledge with you. Have a nice day and um, I hope the event uh, is a great success. Uh, th let's thank our panel, they were amazing. Hey.